Let's start by reimagining yourselves away from a lovely, gorgeous autumn day in Melbourne and imagine yourselves instead out on the Persian steppe between Meshed and Herat on a hot summer's night in 1837. And coming towards you along the road is a single figure on a horse. This guy has been riding for two days and a night. And as he's coming towards you, you can see that he's dropping in the saddle. He's exhausted. There's a war about to break out. The new Shah of Iran, Mohammed II Qajar, has mobilized his troops. And he's about to fulfill his coronation promise to retake the disputed border city of Herat. And this young man on the horse, his name is Henry Rawlinson. He's aged about 27. He's the son of a racehorse dealer from Newmarket and has grown up in the saddle. Uh, he's been riding for two days in the night and he's had enough. He's exhausted. Because the war's about to break out, he can't change his horse at the caravan's rise. There's normally a very good system for this. But that's impossible tonight. And sometime about between two and three in the morning, he falls asleep in the saddle. We don't know how long he's asleep for, but he nods forward. He doesn't fall off, which is an important point. But when he wakes up, after maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour, I don't know how long you can stay asleep on the saddle without falling off a horse, but when he wakes up, he's, the horse has wandered off the highway. And he's in the middle of the desert. And it's the middle of the night. And even at the best of times, this is not the sort of place you particularly want to get lost. Even today, this is what we in Scotland call debatable land. This is the land between two uh, uh, rival polities. Uh, it's the place where brigands and opium smugglers head out. And of course, there's two armies about to break into war, but, uh, exactly where you're lost. And so he's very relieved when after two hours of trying to refine the road and failing, he sees the first fingers of dawn lighting up the Kohi Shah Jahan mountains ahead of him. And he sees where he is. He's in this broad, open desert valley with hills on either side of him. And just as he's beginning to work out where's north and south and would find his way back to the road, he sees what he least wants to see. Ahead of him, coming directly to him, is what at first looks like a, a, a large dust cloud, but which soon resolves itself into a large body of cavalry heading directly down this narrow valley, and he's in their trajectory. Now, he does what any one of us would do in this situation. He tries to make himself as small as possible. He disappears off down a little side alley uh, and waits to see who these horsemen are. They could be brigands or opium smugglers or the Persians or the Heratis. But what he sees changes the history of Central Asia for the next hundred years. And what he sees is... Well, actually, before I tell you what he sees, I think we need some... We need a little... Um, that's a little context to... Um, to um... So, we, this is 1837. This is, what, 20 years after Waterloo. And Napoleon has been knocked out of the picture. There's now two powers competing to... Um, there's two powers competing to divide Asia between them. And... To the south, there's the British, but it's not the British. It is the East India Company. It's not the British government. It's the East India Company. It's a public limited company. It's a very weird bit of history. Because the East India Company is something we've all grown up with, we, we kind of take it for granted. In reality, though, it's, it's a deeply sinister and rather strange institution. It is a public limited company. It has, you know, 
what things the companies have. It has boardrooms and an annual general meeting and shareholders, you know, making a noise if they don't get their profits and it has, uh, you know, dividends and all that kind of stuff. But it also has the largest standing army in Asia. There is no modern equivalent. I mean, you have to imagine, I don't know, sort of Halliburton with nuclear submarines or Microsoft with F-16s or something to, uh, to, to get the equivalent. But... Um, The East India Company has gobbled up in less than 40 years the entire territory that was held by the old Mughal Empire. They've broken out of their coastal ports of Madras, Bombay, and uh, and, uh, Calcutta. And they've conquered in 50 years more territory than Napoleon ever conquered of Europe. It's an extraordinary bit of history. It's a a company still. It's still publishing accounts every year. It's still giving dividends to its shareholders. Uh, But it's also uh, conquered a continent. Meanwhile, at the same time as all this is going on, the Russians are moving southwards. And ever since the time of Peter the Great, the Tsar's armies have absorbed about 100 miles every decade. Uh, And any old fool sitting in some club in Pall Mall or any officer in his sort of Anna Karen in the world in St. Petersburg, looking at a map, can see that these two empires are coming together. And at some point, they have to meet in the middle. And the point they're going to meet is in the unmapped territory that we today call Afghanistan, which at that point is split up. But there's still a huge amount of territory between them. There is on the British side of the Himalayas, if you like, Ranjit Singh's Sikh Empire, which holds the whole of what, what is now modern Pakistan. While on the northern side of the Himalayas, and the Russian side, if you like, are Tashkent, Bukhara, Kiva, Samarkand, all these great um, Central Asian caravan cities, which now make up the different stands. So there's a huge territory between them. But this doesn't stop the different... Um, you know, the kind of right-wing polemicists in London, that the 19th century equivalents of Neil Ferguson or, uh, or um, I don't know, Daniel Pipes or Andrew Roberts or one of these sort of characters, writing these sort of toxic, um, hawkish uh, sort of um, polemics in the papers. And they urge the British onwards. They say, go on, conquer Central Asia. If you grab... The highlands, if you open up the Indus, not only will the markets of Central Asia be yours, not only will we deprive the Russians of this, but you can open, you'll control the roundabout, you control the crossroads of Central Asia. You can move from Samarkand to Delhi, from Iran to China. All this can be yours if you just get your act together and go and conquer it. Um, which is why what Rawlinson sees in his river valley... Um, that early dawn in 1837 matters. Because what he sees is not the opium smugglers, it's not the brigands, it's not the Persian army, or it's not even the Herates. What he sees coming towards him that morning, and he only sees it because these guys have cast off their disguise and... They think they're near the Afghan frontier. They think they're unobserved. And only the fact that Rawlinson happened to be lost, have wandered off the road in this extremely unlikely bit of territory, only that chance happening means that he sees what he sees. And what he sees is a whole regiment of Russian imperial Cossack cavalry heading from Persia into Afghanistan. And his groom, who is with him on the back of his horse, sees his counterpart, a groom from the Russian legation in Tehran, which proves that this is a Russian diplomatic mission of some sort heading into Afghanistan. And for a British intelligence officer of the 1830s, this is the weapons of mass destruction of its day. This is the big find. Or rather, it's actually more the yellow cake because it's not what it seems. It is, in fact, what he sees is, in fact, a party of Russians exploring the possibility of maybe opening diplomatic relations. But by the time the news has reached Calcutta, it can be inflated, massaged, and fiddled with 
in a way that couldn't possibly happen today, of course, <laughs> to provide a group of ideologically driven hawks the excuse to fight a war that they already want to fight. This provides the evidence for these guys to go to war completely unnecessarily against Russia and to declare this slightly mad campaign against uh, Afghanistan. And as it, you know, there's a long way between the East India Company and Afghanistan. It's, it's, a, it's a crazy mission in every way that you could imagine. And as I say, it couldn't happen today. So here we have the British ambassador in Tehran. We should declare that he who is not with us is against us. We must secure Afghanistan. Just like... Uh, Today, you have all those, uh, you know, those New York Times editorials on, uh, you know, what is the duty of an imperial power? Are we there to, um, you know, pragmatically in order to conquer territory and deprive our enemies of it? Or are we actually there on some sort of sort of super NGO mission um, to whip those Afghan women out of their burqas and put them all in miniskirts? Um, here is the 19th century equivalent of all that. There is nothing more to be dreaded or guarded against, I think, than the overweening confidence with which we are too often accustomed to regard the excellence of our own institutions and the anxiety that we display to introduce them in new and untried soils. Such interference will always lead to acrimonious disputes, if not to a violent reaction. In other words, we don't do nation building. This is the Rumsfeld Doctrine. So, despite all the reservations and despite all the uh, difficulties, the hawks get their way. Now, there's by no means any unanimity among the British about what should be done. There's the, the guy who actually knows most about uh, Afghanistan is this young man called Alexander Burns, who's this slightly oversexed sort of Scottish spy. And he has... <laughs> He's been exploring this region for a while. In 1832, as a 25-year-old, he's done the most audacious bit of great game spy craft that has yet been tried. The British have tried to have succeeded in penetrating the markets of India by sending their steamships up the Ganges and opening up their, all the central India to their sails and their wares. And the merchants and all the guys in Calcutta from the East India Company want to do the same to the Indus. The difficulty is that the Indus has never been mapped and that there's the Amirs of Sindh at the bottom and then there's Ranjit Singh at the top, neither of whom want the British anywhere near their river. So they have to find some way of getting permission to map and explore the river. And they can't do it, um, they can't do it openly because, it's, uh, because these two powers will block them. And then Alexander Burns comes up with this brilliant ruse. It's the kind of, you know, it's the kind of the, the M, not M, who's a Q uh, in James Bond. It's the Q moment. He says, he realises that Ranjit Singh, the Sikh leader, loves horses. He's even actually fought a small war against a uh, small Himalayan principality in order to capture a single stallion. So he says, what we'll do is we will offer him as a present from the King of England, the largest horses in the world, which, of course, are just a bunch of Suffolk dray horses, cart horses from Suffolk. But, uh, so they ship over four Suffolk drays on a, on a, on a boat, uh, and they land them at Karachi. And then someone thinks, I know, we'd better have something, this isn't quite grand enough. So they find an old carriage, which used to belong to the Lord Mayor of London, and they re it, and this arrives in Karachi, and they ask permission to Ranjit Singh to float this ridiculous bunch of presents up the Indus in order that they can present it to him. But he says, of course, we don't want these things getting damaged on route, these lovely presents. Go and put your raft up the river. Inside the old Lord Mayor of London's coach is a team of crack naval hydrographers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not making this up. This is true. <laughs> who map the river, who, who take the flow. And do, and I've seen the actual results of this expedition in the National Archives in Delhi. Uh, and they produce this incredibly detailed sort of early 19th century kind of scientific kind of um, nerd sort of report on the Indus with every imaginable detail about the flow, the depth and everything as a result of this crazy scheme. Now, Alexander Burns, the guy that's done this, subsequently 
goes on to Kabul, same, as part of the same expedition, and then on into Central Asia. And his secret mission, having mapped, in a sense, done one of the big jobs of the early great game, to map the Indus, his next big mission is to see whether there are, where the Russians are infiltrating in, in Central Asia. So he's sent off to Bukhara, and he has to find out where the Russians are. He goes there, and there's no sign of the Russians. So he sends his intelligence reports in, and then he goes and writes a travel book. And then he goes, and, uh, goes on tour, he goes to the Royal Geographical Society, he presents it at the French Geographical Society. The book is translated into French, the Russians read it in French, and immediately send their agents to see if there are any Brits in Central Asia. So begins the Great Game. So exactly in the same way that the Americans invaded Iraq to stop Al-Qaeda being there, when there was no Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and Al-Qaeda only went to Iraq after the Americans invaded it. So in this period, the, the British start the great game. So the kind of lesson to be drawn is imperial paranoia can create the very demons you most fear by sort of, you can imagine these things into existence. Anyway, Burns is bright. He's no fool. And he's sent back on a second expedition in 1838 to see what's going on. The Hawks busily want their war. They're all set to declare a, a major... Um, campaign to take Afghanistan. And Burns goes back to Kabul and he says, guys, this is simply not necessary. You've got yourself in a great tiz about this Russian expedition, but actually Dost Mohammed, the man who runs Afghanistan, would much prefer an alliance with the British. A little bit of fancy diplomatic footwork and we can win Afghanistan with a treaty. We don't have to send a single soldier there. But he's ignored. And largely he's ignored because all his superiors are sick to the back teeth of Burns. Uh, Burns is younger than them. He's about 30 years younger than them. He's been received by the Queen at Buckingham Palace. He's been to Paris. He's got the Royal Medal of the British and French Geographical Society. And his superiors absolutely hate him. And the man who hates him most is M, the British spy master Claude Wade, who is that familiar figure that we see in, in many capitals today, the Afghan expert who's ever been to Afghanistan. And he's been totally usurped by Burns. And he says, there's no way we should listen to this guy. He's young and inexperienced, and, and, and he's a bit of an idiot anyway. Uh, and we need to invade Afghanistan. And I've got just the plan. So he presents plan B. Plan B is there is this guy called Shah Shuja, who is the grandson of the founder of the Afghan empire. The founder of the Afghan empire is Ahmed Shah Durrani, who himself is a rather sinister figure. He's, he's one of the great warlords of Asian history. He conquers Afghanistan, most of Iran, Kashmir, all of modern Pakistan, and India as far as Delhi in a single series of campaigns. But at the same time, his face is being eaten up by an ulcer, a gangrenous ulcer. So he's like Robocop. He's got this sort of half-mask face. Uh, and this silver nose covered with diamonds. I mean, it must have been quite a sight on a cold night on a <laughs> come across in Kabul. But he, anyway, his grandson, as is often the way, is in, rather than, you know, he's got this kind of frightful militaristic granddad. And Shah Shuja, who's the grandson who inherits this empire, or what's left of it, instead likes poetry, you know, Persian couplets, um, appreciates a nice, you know, kind of fancy Kashmiri meal, uh, writes a beautiful autobiography. Uh, but is completely uninterested in all the, um, you know, the kind of business of fighting wars. So inevitably, by the age of 21, he totally loses his empire. He goes into exile in the Punjab, where Ranjit Singh takes off him his, his most precious possession, which is the largest diamond in the world, the Koh i Noor, which he's unwisely just got in his pocket as he's wandering around. Ranjit Singh takes this off him, and he ends up, age 22, an exile in Ludhiana, where Claude Wade, the M of the story, the spy master, is sitting. So Claude Wade has been sitting here sending off Kashmiri carpet dealers with mapping equipment rolled up in their carpets and all this sort of stuff, so as to map the Himalayas. Uh, and Shah Shuja has for 20 years been his next door neighbor. So he says, look, we've got this guy. We've got this guy. We can, all we have to do is put him back on the throne. We can say it's putting back the true monarch of Afghanistan, which in fact he is. And we can then withdraw, uh, leaving our man. Now, the fact that Hamid Karzai is the direct ancestor of Shah Shuja, of course, has nothing to do with the story at all. So, 
by 1839, by 1839, where can we put it? Hang on. Sorry about that. Um, by 1839, the army of the Indus has collected in Ferozpur. There are 14,000 East India Company sepoys, 6,000 Rahila irregulars, 21,000 troops in all, accompanied by 38,000 Indian camp followers. And they go off to war on more than 30,000 camels. One brigadier needs 50 camels to carry his kit, as one does. Um, while the ranking British general needs 260 for his medals and all his uniforms. Uh, the, leader, the Bengal division, which marches first, takes its pack of foxhounds with it. The, there are 3,000 camels devoted to carrying the regimental wine cellar. 30 camels carry cheroots and cigars. And one camel goes all the way to Afghanistan with only um, eau de cologne for the officers in its backpacks. The only thing these guys don't bother bringing is a map, because they haven't got one. There is no map of the way in. So in they go, kind of marching into, um, marching into Central Asia. Uh, and it's one of those familiar scenes, you know, which way is Afghanistan? Go straight, sir, go straight. Uh, and <laughs> we've all been there in that Indian moment. And, and you go straight, and you get completely lost. And these guys wander around the mountains. They go up the Bolan Pass, down the Kojak Pass. They wander through the deserts of Baluchistan in the middle of summer. And they lose about a quarter of their troops just through idiocy, incompetence, and, uh, and sort of, you know, the sort of capacity of the British to kind of, you know, do a piss up in a brewery at this point. But nonetheless, such is the momentum of, the, uh, of this enormous army heading into Central Asia, that when the remnants of this army debouche out of the Kojak Pass in Helmand, and um, exactly where your Aussie troops are at this moment, uh, and pass through to uh, Kandahar, the rulers of Kandahar flee without firing a shot, and the British take Kandahar and then, luckily at this point, British intelligence, which as we know never makes any errors at all, um, tells them that, uh, uh, that there are no um, fortifications in Ghazni. So they head off uh, towards Ghazni across Afghanistan, only to find that Ghazni is in fact the largest fortress in Central Asia. Uh, so they have to kind of blow that up on the way. But that's the one engagement they have. And by, within a month, they've arrived in Kabul, Shah Shuja, who left at 21, is put back on the throne at the age of 51. Uh, and everyone is feeling rather smug. Uh, the Russians, meanwhile, have lost an entire army going off to um, uh, try and take Kiva. So the British have scored Kabul and the, and the Russians have lost Kiva. So it's sort of one nil uh, to the Raj. Um, the trouble is that in the smugness of this conquest, are sown the seeds of every disaster which is to come. First thing is that Burns, who knew this was an ill-advised expedition and an unnecessary expedition, has been bought off, as Brits continue to be, with the promise of a knighthood. So Sir Alexander Burns is now the deputy governor. The guy in charge is this complete idiot called William McNaughton. Paul McNaughton should never have left the secretary's office, right, Burns. He is ignorant of men, even to simplicity, and utterly incapable of forming and guiding administrative measures. The judicial line would probably have suited him best, and even then, only in the Court of Appeal, judging written evidence. <laughs> so the ideal man to be the governor of Afghanistan. And he commands that, that, given that it's clear that the Afghans are just a bunch of pussies, that they don't need to fortify themselves in any way, and so they just lay out their tents in the valley. And eventually they dig a little kind of ditch around it and put up a palisade. But it's still a completely unfortified site. You know, and no, no one um, with any sense would ever put a, a, you know, a barracks there. It's now the NATO barracks in, in Kabul. Um, and then, they, then gradually sort of, you know, the accountants get to work and they realise that this is an impossibly... That it's quite easy to conquer Afghanistan. What is not easy is to hold it. 
It's not that the Afghans can't be conquered, and it's a myth that the Afghans have never been conquered. The Afghans have been conquered by, the, by Alexander the Great, by the Huns, by the Kushans, by the Mughals, by anyone that knows the medieval history. There's a whole succession of people who hold what's now Afghanistan very easily. What is difficult, though, is financing it. It is when Dost Mohammed surrenders to McNaughton. He says, why have you come? This is a land of stones and men. And it gradually dawns on the British that they've spent a huge amount of money and thrown thousands of troops at a place that has absolutely no commercial value whatsoever. <laughs> and despite all that mapping of the Indus, they find that, in fact, it's still unsuitable because of the moving sandbanks, which they weren't able to anticipate. It's not a reliable place to send steamers up in the way that the Ganges is. So the whole reason for going in evaporates. And the British find that they very, they've got, they, at a very huge cost, which is eating up the entire profit of the East India Company, they've moved into this territory that they don't, can't afford to hold. It's the economics of it that's doing them in, not the, not the military impossibility of it, which, of course, remains the same today. You know, the, the, the Americans haven't been defeated in Afghanistan. It's just that they, 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 you know, they can't be bothered to hold it anymore. It's costing too much money. It's too many people being killed. It's just not worth it. So... They can't, some accountant comes up with a brilliant idea. He says, I know what we'll do. We will train up an Afghan national army. <laughs> and then we can withdraw. So this is what they do. They train up an Afghan national army. Brilliant idea. Can't possibly go wrong. And, but in order to get the money for this, they have to withdraw the estates from all the, uh, the nobles. Um, and... Um, this pisses off the nobles who, who want to keep their estates. They're quite happy to have a, a new king who's slightly less effective than the old ruler. Uh, what they don't want is to lose their, lose their um, estates. And then, you know, again, it couldn't happen today. They go off and invade somewhere else before they've established Afghanistan. It's not Iraq in this case, it's Hong Kong. Uh, it's the Opium War. 1841, Lord Auckland, the same idiot who opens up the Afghan War, goes and declares the first opium war on the principle of free trade. We need to have the right to sell drugs to the Chinese. <laughs> so all the troops are withdrawn from Afghanistan, and Afghanistan is left with a skeleton garrison of only a few thousand troops. It was about 25,000 or 38,000 originally, and now it's down to uh, about 4,500 troops in Kabul. And then everything else begins to go pear-shaped. The Afghans don't particularly, you know, a pretty xenophobic bunch at the best of times, but they particularly don't want to be under occupation. And there's, you know, these Brits behaving like Friday night in some provincial town in England, spilling out of the pubs, being sick everywhere. There's Indians spitting pan all over the place. Um, and the sepoys. And everyone, you know, is, the, the Afghans hate both the British and the Indians. And then the British and the Indians start sleeping with the Afghan women. And this is a big, big no-no. And Alexander Burns even seduces the girlfriend of one of the leading noblemen in court. Um, a few, incidentally, a few memsabs have come up. Lady Sale, who's this, my favourite character in the, the whole book, she comes with her grand piano, her unmarried daughter, and her kitchen garden. She brings all her seeds from Agra and writes, My sweet peas and geraniums were much admired, and in the kitchen garden the potatoes especially thrive. Uh, but despite that, most people haven't got their memsabs, and we have this sort of wholesale um, sort of turning of, of sort of Kabul into a pub and a brothel. And this goes down very badly. And when Alexander Burns starts sleeping with one of the slave girls of Abdullah Khan at Chaksai, this is the final straw. Now, I'm sure, you know, there are similar scenes in Adelaide every day. You know, some guy loses his girlfriend, he goes and throws a few stones through the window uh, of the other guy. In this case, though, being Afghanistan, what you have instead is that Abdullah Khan Achaksai turns up outside Burns' house with some of his friends. He doesn't throw stones through the window. He sets fire to Alexander Burns' house. He cuts up Alexander Burns into tiny pieces. Uh, he kicks his head around as a football and hangs up what remains of the trunk on a meat hook in the bazaar. And then he makes a speech. Now we are justified in throwing off the English yoke. They stretch the hand of tyranny and dishonour private citizens great and small. Making love to a slave girl isn't worth the ritual bath that follows it, but we have to put a stop to it right here, right now. Otherwise, and this is the key phrase, 
Otherwise, these English will ride the donkey of their desires into the field of stupidity. <laughs> now, we've all done that in our time, but, you know, yeah, it's not wise to do it in, in Kabul. And so all hell breaks loose. The leading uh, Burns' boss, Sir William McNaughton, the guy who shouldn't have been let out of the courtroom without judging only written evidence, that guy, goes out and negotiates with the Afghans and gets shot dead by the Afghan negotiating team. <laughs> then the leading British general gets onto his horse. This is uh, Sir William Elphinstone, the leading uh, British uh, com commandant in Kabul. He's a gout-ridden old uh, veteran of Waterloo who hasn't seen action in 20 years. He... And he only got the job because Lord Auckland wants to go shooting. He has the best grout moors in the borders. Uh, and um, Lord Auckland wants to go shooting there in his retirement. Uh, so oh, by this stage, Elphinstone is more or less a complete invalid. Uh, he gets onto his horse. He falls off his horse. The horse falls on him, and that's the end of Elphinstone. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that's more or less the end of British resistance to the whole, to the whole Afghan uprising. Um, they very intelligently placed all their supplies... Um, in a uh, fort, which isn't inside the contumement, but is near the old city. And the Afghans capture this within the first 48 hours of the uprising. Uh, they then wheel the British cannons up onto a hill above the contumement and just start shelling the British. And it's all over by the end of November. And there follows about two months of negotiations when the British threaten various things. But the Afghans know that the longer they... Um, procrastinate, the less chance there is of any reinforcements coming because by the end of November or certainly early December, the passes will close, the snows will come. And the British haven't clicked to this. And so they delay these, they procrastinate on, negoci on negotiations and by the end of December there's no hope at all, either of the, uh, the British sending reinforcements from India or indeed the Kabul garrison being relieved by the outlying garrisons in Jalalabad and Kandahar, which are governed by more sensible generals. Uh, but there's no hope of them getting to Kabul in December. So these guys are completely cut off. There's only 4,500 of them, uh, only 4,500 troops. And they have no option but to surrender. 18 months after these guys marched in with their, you know, their scarlet cloaks and their plumed helmets and all the rest of it, and their foxhounds and their eau de cologne, 18 months later, they're surrendering and they're given, the court promises them free passage back to India. But the guys in the passes, the Gilzai tribe, have no intention at all of letting these guys go because there's plunder and all the rest of it. So on the 6th of January, 1842, the retreat from Kabul begins. There are 4,500 troops, of whom 700 are British. The rest are Indians from Bihar and Uttar Pradesh who've never seen snow before and are completely out of their depth in mountain or winter warfare. The sepoys have brought with them 12,000 camp followers, wives, children, shopkeepers, grooms, all this sort of stuff. And... Among the British officers is my great-great-uncle, one of the few survivors of this story, who is a man called Colin Mackenzie. And this is his account. At 9am, the troops moved off. A crouching, drooping, dispirited army. So different from the smart, light-hearted body of men they appeared some time ago. The men sank a foot deep in the snow with each step. My heart sunk within me under the conviction that we were a doomed force. I always remember as one of the most heart-rending sights of that humiliating day, fixing my eyes by chance on a little Hindustani child, perfectly naked, sitting in the snow, with no mother or father near her. She was a beautiful little girl, about two years old, just strong enough to sit upright with her little legs doubled underneath her hair curling in waving locks around her soft little throat, and her great black eyes dilated to twice their normal size, fixed on the arm men, the passing cavalry, and all the strange sights that met her gaze. Many other children as young as innocent I saw slain on the road, and women with their long dark hair wet with their own blood. 
The rear guard had to fight the whole way to Bagrami and pass through a literally continuous line of poor wretches. Men, women and children, dead or dying from colds or wounds, who, unable to move, entreated their comrades to kill them and put an end to their misery. So the British managed to do a second time the big mistake of the beginning of the uprising. They lose their commissariat. First out of the cantonment is the cavalry, then follows the infantry, and finally come the baggage. But the, no one's guarding the baggage. It's sitting on the banks of the Kabul River waiting to cross. The jihadis and all the ghazis from the town fall on it and seize it. So by the time that the cavalry arrive at the camping site for the first night, they're sitting, all these guys are sitting there in their boots waiting for their tea and their tents and their dinner. No tea, no tents, no dinner. Six o'clock, it's got dark and it's cold and there's still no tea or tent or dinner. Ten o'clock, it's quite clear that nothing's coming and the night sky is suddenly lit up with an orange inferno as the cantonments are, are set alight and there's clearly no going back. The temperature is now minus 30. Thick snowdrifts. And these sepoys have never been in snow before. They have no idea what to do in this situation. Now, Colin McKenzie has his Afghan jezilchis. These are the guys with their long-barreled Afghan rifles. His, if you like, the Afghan mercenaries working for the British. And they know exactly what to do in this situation. They dig foxholes, little circular foxholes for themselves in the snow. And they light a fire in the middle of the foxhole, and then they lie down like, you know, numbers on a clock or petals on a flower or something with their feet facing the fire, and they sit body to body so their body heat keeps them alive, and they cover themselves with all their cloaks, their turbans, any clothing or textiles they have. And it's not a very comfy night, but they've still got all their bits the following morning. Unlike the poor sepoys, about half of whom die that night in the snow when it hits minus 40. Those who survive wake up to find that they have their extremities, their fingers and their toes are like charred logs of wood. They've got frostbite. They're completely incapacitated on night one. There's six days march through to Jalalabad. And at this point, Akbar Khan, the leader of the resistance comes up behind them and drives them all into the Kulkabul Pass where a perfect ambush has been constructed. The Afghans know that the British brown best musket, which is a vicious weapon that fires this horrible lead slug that won Waterloo, but it only goes about 300 yards. They know that their jezails, which are much more old-fashioned and clumsy things, but with a big charge, they can be made to fire about half a mile. So they just put their jezails halfway up the mountains they wait for the British to be driven in. And by this stage, a lot of the sepoys are on their hands and knees crawling because they can't walk. And they can't use their fingers because their fingers are frostbitten. And this the mother of all ambushes is sprung on the British. It's a terribly narrow pass. There's only about five or six men can pass through it at a single time. Lady Sale is at the front. The confusion was fearful. We had not proceeded half a mile when we were heavily fired upon. The pony Mrs. Sturt rode was wounded in the ear and the neck. I fortunately had only one musket ball in my arm. Three others passed through my cloak near the shoulder without doing me any injury. The pass completely choked up and for a considerable period we were stationary under heavy fire. That night, the sepoys in camp followers, half frozen, tried to force their way not just into the tents, but into the beds. Many poor wretches died around the tent that night. Many women and children were abducted. So 18,000 men, women and children leave the cantonment on the 6th of January. There's only about 15,000 that make it through the... Sorry, 11,000 who make it through the Korkabul Pass between the, the first night in the snow... And the ambush which follows, about 7,000 out of the 18,000 are killed. They then have to go uphill, up the Tezin Pass, to the highest point in the journey. And there they're caught in a blizzard. And of the 11,000 who go up the hill, only 2,000 come down. At the bottom, the Afghans have arranged another ambush at the next narrowest point of the pass, at Jagdalik. And there they erect a holly hedge with spikes and thistles and every kind of spiky thing they can find. And the British hit it at about 6.30, just as it's getting dark. 
And there's a complete confusion. The infantry are trampled by the cavalry. The cavalry try to climb over the, jump over this thing. The infantry are stuck on the thorns. And there's a horrible sight, huge piles of bodies. And only 200 men make it beyond. They are surrounded the following day at a village called Gundamuk. Anyone that has read Flashman will know this scene well. And the British form a square, which is the standard sort of infantry. They know that they're not going to get it. There's 10,000 Afghans surrounding them. So they form a square and they fight to their last bullet. Then they fight on with their bayonets. And then they're all killed by one man. The cavalry, there's about 15 cavalry make it beyond this point. And they finally get to Shah Jahan's gorgeous Mughal gardens. This sort of vision arises between them of cedar trees and, and runnels and all in this sort of perfect sort of Von Trapp family winter scene. And the gardeners are there. So the gardeners offer them breakfast. And these guys haven't eaten for five days. So they get off their horses and they accept bread and, and yogurt from the, the Malis. And the Malis club them to death when they're eating their breakfast. One man, Dr. Bryden, the assistant surgeon, makes it through to Jalalabad. Out of 18,500 who left only six days earlier. He survived only because he's wrapped up Blackwood's magazine in his hat. It's a literary magazine with a leather binding. And so when they take a swipe at him with the sword, it goes through the leather binding, but it doesn't go into his head. Lady Sale's husband, General Sale, who's a competent general, who's in charge of Jalalabad, says, where is the army? And Bryden says, I am the army. Everyone else is either dead, enslaved, or captured. But the Afghans have a very hierarchical system with their captives. The British officer class is taken aside, including my great uncle, Colin McKenzie, and kept as a hostage because the British have Dost Mohammed plus his harem, and they have to get them back. But the Indian sepoys have got no saviors. The British officers abandon them. There's nothing much they can do, in fact. But in reality, they, they simply give them up to their fate. And the Afghans divide them into two. So there's about 7,000 men who've been taken hostage who haven't been killed at this point. Of those 7,000, the majority are who have got the frostbite, who are wounded, who are regarded as unsellable. They have their clothes taken off them, and they're just driven out into the snowdrifts to die. About 3,000 are considered commodities, and they are sold into slavery to the Uzbek slavers. And the Uzbeks at this period have a particularly gruesome way with their captives. They take a needle that you use for making carpets in Afghanistan, and they sew a horsehair rope through the clavicles of their captives and attach four or five of these ropes to a single saddle and then they ride off and your hands are tied behind your back. And if you don't keep up with the captive, your entire chest frame is ripped out. It's an excruciating agony. And this breaks a man's spirit. Nonetheless, about 50 or 60 sepoys somehow managed to escape. And it's these men, including Subhada Bakh Khan, who start up the Indian Mutiny in 1857. These guys have been abandoned by their officers. They get home and they tell how, A, the British have been defeated, and how, B, the British couldn't care less about the sepoys. And it's exactly the regiments which were in Afghanistan who were the first to mutiny when the next big thing takes place. Meanwhile, the British hostages are being led off to captivity, bound and chained, including my great uncle. And what they describe is, is scenes of unimaginable horror. We passed some 200 dead bodies in a single hour, writes Lady Sale. Many of them were European. All of them were naked and covered with large gaping wounds. What she doesn't say is that it's standard Afghan practice at this stage to cut the genitals off any soldier and stuff the mouth with them, which is a way of insulting the dead. As the day advanced, several poor wretches of Hindustanis, camp followers who had escaped the massacre of the night before, made their appearance behind rocks and within caves where they'd taken shelter from the murderous knives of the Afghans and the inclemency of the climate. They had been stripped of all they possessed. 
And a few could crawl more than a few hands and yards, sorry, few could mo- crawl more than a few yards on their hands and knees, being frostbitten in the feet. Here Johnson found two of his servants, and one with his hands and feet frostbitten, and the other had a fearful sword cut on one hand and a musket ball in his stomach. The first had his right arm completely cut off through the bone. Both were utterly destitute of covering and had not tasted food for five days. Wounded and starving, they'd set fire to bushes and grass and huddled together to impart warmth to each other. Subsequently, we heard that scarcely any of these poor wretches escaped from this defile and that driven to extremes of hunger, they had sustained life by feeding upon their dead comrades. So scenes of unimaginable horror for the Brits and worse for the sepoys. But for the Afghans, this is their big national liberation struggle. What Washington and Yorktown is to the Americans, what Michael Collins and the Easter Rising is for the Irish, what uh, I don't, Gandhi and the Salt March is for the Indians. This is for the Afghans. Wazir Akbar Khan, who leads the resistance, now has the diplomatic quarter of Kabul named after him. While Shah Shuja's descendant, Hamid Karzai, is regarded as being from the, the family of Quislings, the kind of Vichy France, which is why Karzai has to distance himself at every stage if he's to be electoral success to, uh, from, the, from his American paymasters. Mirza Atta is one of the great Afghan chroniclers of this. And already, he's writing in only 1844, two years after this, but already the numbers are growing and the story is, is sort of marching off. It is said that 60,000 English troops, half from Bengal, half from other provinces, without counting camp servants and followers, went to Afghanistan. And only a handful came back alive, wounded and destitute. The rest fell with neither grave nor shroud to cover them and lay scattered in that land like rotting donkeys. For the English love gold and money so much that they cannot stop themselves from laying their hands on any area productive of wealth. But what prize did they find in Afghanistan except on the one hand the exhausting of their treasury and on the other hand the disgracing of their army? It is said that 40,000 English troops have been in Kabul. Many were taken captive en route. Others remained as cripples and beggars. But the rest perished in the mountains. Like a ship sunk without trace. For it is no easy thing to invade and occupy the kingdom of Khorasan. These English had hoped to establish themselves in Afghanistan, to block any Russian advance. But for all the treasure they expended and for all the lives they sacrificed, the only result was ruin and disgrace. If the English had been able to take and keep Afghanistan, would they really have left this land where 44 different types of grape grow? And other fruit as well. Apples, pomegranates, pears, rhubarb, mulberries, Sweet watermelon and muskmelon, apricots and peaches, and ice water. Ice water that cannot be found in all the plains of India. For these Indians know neither how to dress nor how to eat. God save me from the fire of their dal and their miserable japatis. So, uh, Mirza Atta signing off on Indian cuisine. So... Anyway, the, um, the British can't let this go, so they send in the army of retribution. And this is the most sinister moment in the whole story. The minute the spring thaw comes through, General Pollock, who's the one really competent army general in India, is sent up from Peshawar. He waits until every sepoy has got 3,000 rounds. He's got everything ready, every bullock, every camel. Is all, the whole thing is properly organized at long last. But when he gets up the Khyber Pass, he destroys every village, he cuts down every tree, he burns every field, he dynamites the main bazaar in Kabul, 
and he leaves Kabul, which up to this point had been the main bazaar in Central Asia. The, I mean, we, we don't have this memory of it, but it, is, it was greater than Samarkand or Bukhara or Kiva or any of them. This was the, the, what he dynamites is the great bazaar built by Ali Madan Khan, who's Shah Jahan's general. It's built the same time as the Taj Mahal and almost as magnificent. Pollock attaches dynamite to every spandrel, to every arch, and he blows the whole thing to bits. And then he marches out. Meanwhile, Dost Muhammad, the man the war the fort was fought to get rid of, is released from house arrest in Derudun, and he meets with the, the new viceroy, Lord Ellenborough. The old viceroy, Auckland, has been sent home in disgrace. And all he has is a, some town in a place called New Zealand to, uh, to commemorate him today. So Ellenborough meets Dost Muhammad at the border and says, basically, look, chum, you go back and clear up the mess we've left. If you trouble us again, or if you make friends with the Russians, we'll come back and we'll blow up your country another time. If you leave us alone, we'll leave you alone. And Dost Muhammad keeps to that. He doesn't break that. Even when the Indian mutiny breaks out a decade later, He's called by the rebels who say, come in and, 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 and come and help us. He doesn't. And the British actually arm him in later years. And he consolidates his territory. Initially, he has only Kabul. Then he captures Jalalabad, Kandahar, Ghazni. He captures Mazari Sharif and the Hindu Kush. And finally, in 1862, he captures Herat. And by the time he dies, Afghanistan has the same shape on the map that it does today. As we speak, the CIA are busy negotiating with the Taliban, the people the war was fought to get rid of in 2001. A kind of perfect arc of idiocy over 170 years. When I began writing this story, I thought the two things I needed to do was A, to find the Afghan sources, which turned out to be incredibly voluminous. There's two epic poems and there's, there's three court histories of... Um, Shah Shuja's own memoirs, none of which for, any, um, for no conceivable reason that I can see has ever been translated into English before. So this book, which tells a very old story, at least tells it in a new way with the Afghan sources. But the other thing it seemed it was necessary to do was to retrace the route of the retreat as well as visiting all the places in the story. Because without that, you can't, I mean, you can't give any, any kind of comprehensive or true picture of it without understanding the geography. But today, Gundamuk, where the last stand took place, where the British formed that square, is under a mountain called Tora Bora, where a more recent uh, last stand took place. And today, it's the heart of Taliban territory. So I couldn't see how he's going to get there. And I had a very lucky break on my second day in Afghanistan when I got arrested by the secret police, which isn't something that initially you particularly welcome. But it turned out that the head of the secret police, a guy called Amrullah Saleh, had read my last book, Last Mogul, and didn't like it. <laughs> and he called me in, and I got so half, something between a kind of interrogation and a bad book review. Um, <laughs> and he said, this book, very bad book. He said, very bad. this time you'll do it better. And he produced, out of a kind of another room, this character called Anwar Khan Jigdalik, who, who, <laughs> who was the, the, the ex champion of the Afghan Olympic wrestling team. I'm not taking this out. Who was, a, who was a Mujahideen commander. He was about 18 foot tall by about 20 foot wide. And um, he said, this man will take you. This man will take you. So off we went, Amar Khan and I, and our, with all his merry men in a bunch of pickups, off to Tora Bora. And in fact, although technically Taliban territory, all the intelligence was that in fact there'd been no trouble at all and it would be perfectly easy to kind of swoop in, swoop out, as long as you didn't spend too long and wander around and chat too much. Um, but anyway, we never got further than Jigdalik, the place where the Holly Hedge was erected, because that was Jigdalik's home, the, the, the wrestler's home, and he turned out to be the local hero. It was like sort of wandering around with Kylie Minogue here or something, I don't know, well, who's a... Um, who would be the equivalent? Uh, Jeffrey Rush? I don't know. Anyway, so, so everyone sort of wanted to get, cook him dinner. And, um, and so we had this um, feast that went on for about seven hours. And we got there about 11 in the morning and didn't leave till four in the afternoon, by which stage it was quite clear that we weren't going to get to Gundamuk. So like many other of my contemporaries, and, I mean, not my contemporaries, many other of my compatriots, um, I was defeated by the Afghans and had to retreat. 
uh, back to Jalalabad, but discovered when I got to Jalalabad that in fact it was a great saving because that morning, by pure bad chance, the government had come to plough up the poppy crop in Gundamak. The villagers had resisted and the police force that was sent out to do this, five were killed, nine police vehicles were blown up and 90 hostages were taken. So the following morning in Jalalabad, Anwar Khan, my, my guide and protector, was called to be the negotiator in a jirga, a tribal gathering, between the elders of Gundamak and the, uh, and the government. And the jirga took place outside Jalalabad, uh, outside Jalalabad airport, which is the main center of the drone campaign today. And as this negotiation went on for hours and hours, these drones were taking off from behind us. And in, you know, in Hollywood movies, there's always one drone being sort of, you know, commanded from Virginia with a whole bunch of guys in shirt sleeves busy sort of looking at TV screens. And... But in, in reality, in Jalalabad, it's like a London taxi rank. These guys are going off one after another, these sinister, horrible-looking little planes, They're almost entirely silent. They don't make any noise when they take off. Um, and... At the end of the negotiations, Anwar Khan brought up the leaders, the elders of Gandamak, to talk to me. And I, I was very keen to ask them, you know, whether there were any memories of this. And I told them about my great uncle who'd been captured by their great grandfathers. And I asked whether these names meant anything to them. And this is what they said They said, it's exactly the same. Both times the foreigners have come here for their own interests, not for ours. They say, we are your friends, we want to help but they are lying. Whoever comes to Afghanistan, even now, they will face the fate of Burns and McNaughton. Since the British, we've had the Russians. We saw them off too. We are the roof of the world. From here, you can control and watch everywhere. We are like a crossroads for every nation that comes to power. But we do not have the strength to control our own destiny. Our fate is determined by our neighbours. Then one of the old guys, these kind of fantastic-looking old Afghan men with their grey beards and turbans and all their robes and stuff, came up and he, he told me the story. Last month, some of the American officers called us to a hotel in Jalalabad for a meeting. One of them asked me, why do you hate us? And I replied, because you blow down our doors, you enter our houses, you pull our women by the hair, and you kick our children. We cannot accept this. We will fight back. And we will break your teeth. And when your teeth are broken, you will go home, just as the British and the Russians went home before you. It's just a matter of time. What did he say to that, I asked. He turned to his friend and said, if the old men are like this, what will the younger ones be like? <laughs> In truth, all the Americans know that their game is over. It's just their politicians who deny this. This is the last days of the Americans, he said. Next, it will be China. Thank you very much. Thank you for your marvellous book. I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm curious, I know what happened to Lady Sale. You said that in the book. What happened to her daughter? No, I don't know. Um, I know what happened to, to Lady Sale and her husband. Um, the husband and Lady Sale both become a circus act in Astley's Circus, which is the kind of uh, East Enders of its day. And um, then... Sale is killed in the Anglo-Sikh War of 1845. And Lady Sale, as a widow, goes off to South Africa, where she has one of the great epitaphs on her grave, which is simply, here lies all that could die of Lady Sale. <laughs> <laughs> but the copy. daughter, I, I actually don't know. I genuinely don't know. Her picture's in the National Portrait Gallery, and it's in the book, but I, I didn't actually follow up on that. 
Um, uh, can you also tell me who has her diaries and has anybody written her story? It must be extraordinary. The sales diaries are in the India Office diary, in the office, sorry, the India Office uh, records, which are now part of the British Library. And there is a great deal in the manuscript diary, which is erased, stuff like the genitals being cut off, um, which never made it into the printed version, which got serialised in the Times. And if anyone is... I mean, it's very easy these days with a bit of technology to put different sort of spectrums of light through a manuscript, and you can probably retrieve it. I didn't do that. Uh, in my research, I concentrated as much as I could on the Afghan sources to try and balance this overwhelming amount of British stuff. But if anyone wanted to write a biography, and there hasn't been a good one ever done, um, I'm sure you could retrieve a huge amount which has been erased from it. Story, thanks. The back. Um, if I might be permitted to ask a question that relates more to another one of your books, um, From the Holy Mountain, which is my favourite, um, would you care to comment on what might be the fate of the Syrian Christian community in the event of the fall of the Assad regime? Not looking good. Already the Armenian Christians have emigrated en masse. The Armenians sent a few um, airliners to Aleppo. Uh, and, they've, and they've airlifted the Armenian um, Christians from Aleppo. The Syrian Christians are stuck. I mean, the, it's extremely unlikely, I think, that the Assad regime will survive, ultimately. Numbers are against it. And the, the likelihood is we're going to see a further emigration of, of the Middle Eastern Christians, um, which is exactly what's going on at the moment in Egypt. A lot of them are coming here. Uh, uh, Australia has been good to the Middle Eastern Christians and there's large communities here in Melbourne, I think mainly Lebanese here, and uh, a lot of cops in uh, Cairo, in uh, Sydney. Um, but again, another story which um, would repay um, more uh, journalism here. The uh, Afghanistan is very varied, and, it's, and the difficulty researching there is it's difficult to know which mode to go in, because the Afghans are extremely hospitable in general, and they have this ethic of looking after travellers. And so if you go to them, they will risk, you know, the, if it all goes well, they'll risk their lives protecting you. And a lot of the places, a lot of it's fine. I mean, Kabul is like a French finishing school. It's full of French, gorgeous French girls, sort of, you know, working for NGOs and handsome, handsome French archaeologists and this kind of stuff. But, uh, and Mazar i Sharif is, is safe. For most of my travels, Herat was fine, though it's a bit dodgy now. Ghazni is not fine, Jalalabad's not fine, and Kandahar is the assassination capital of Asia. Uh, the year that I was, the, kind of, the, the two or three years I was doing the most intensive research there, the governor, Ahmed Wali Karzai, Karzai's brother was shot, the mayor was shot, the deputy mayor was shot, and the, there were three attacks on the Indian consulate. Uh, so it wasn't a good place to be. Uh, but it's very difficult, to, you know, you never quite know which of those two... Um, incidentally, I mean, if anyone wants a nice adventure holiday... Um, I'm, not, I'm only half joking here. Um, I took my wife and kids to Kabul a month ago, and it couldn't have been easier. You can get a, a, a Af I'm being totally serious, you can get an Afghan tourist visa more or less over the counter, um, certainly in Delhi. Uh, there are daily flights from Delhi. It's only an hour from Delhi to Kabul. It's closer to Delhi than either Bombay, Madras, or, or um, Calcutta. Uh, and... Um, Mazar Sharif is fine. Herat is okay, and not as good as it was, but doable. And if you want to see Afghanistan, go now because it's not going to be okay next year, um, and it's going to be worse. <laughs> and it's going to be worse thereafter. So, quite seriously, anyone who's, who, who who likes a bit of um, a bit of a challenge, it's an incredible country, and things are only going to get worse in the near future. 
Uh, was there a big difference between the Afghans recounting the same event and the British, like from the Afghan sources? Yes, I mean, enjoy, in, enjoyably and interestingly different, um, inevitably. Uh, the, the big difference, I suppose, was that the British imagined that they were facing a unified, fanatical Afghan enemy who hated the British. In reality, you have all sorts of different groups, as is quite clear from the very... Because the Afghan sources come from different ethnic groups. You've got the Tajik sources and the Pashtun sources and the Dari sources. And the different groups have different agendas. So the Kohistanis want one thing. They come under their peers. They're, they're camped in one village. The royalists in the old city want something else. They want Shah Shuja, but they don't want the British there. The Barakzai's want the Barakzai restoration. And the British completely miss this. I mean, one of the reasons they lose is that despite the fact they've got lots of good Dari and Urdu speakers, much more than the Americans or the British have today, uh, they don't get the fact that there's very clearly different groups after different things. Also, you have a very nice sort of reversal of Orientalist stereotypes. The British, you know, see these as treacherous, bearded, fanatical bigots. Um, the Afghans rather nicely see the British as treacherous, duplicitous, child, women abusing terrorists. Um, the way that the British turn, you know, use the women of Afghanistan. And there's an awful lot of Afghan polemic about how the British don't know how to treat women. Um, which, given how this sort of, sort of you know, pseudo liberal um, rhetoric about the mini skirts in Kabul, um, is rather nice. And Burns, who in all the great game books, and Peter Hopkirk, and, I mean, I love Peter Hopkirk, but you know, he's nonetheless this sort of very heroic British spy. He is the devil in the Afghan sources. And he's the devil in the, in the kind of you know, master and margarita sense. He's a gentleman. He's good looking. But he chains the nobles and chains of gold and drags them into the pit of hell, is one of the, what the Afghan sources say. Um, so yes, it's, a, it's, it's, you know, it's the perfect mirror image. Alexander Burns, incidentally, is the Scottish poet Robbie Burns' cousin. And as, as, as Robbie Burns says in To a Field Mouse, we allow ourselves to see us as others see us, uh, which is what the Afghan sources allow us to do. Uh, your book is on the first Anglo-Afghan war. Were there any subsequent Anglo-Afghan wars? This is our fourth lost war in Afghanistan. Um, we really, as, as Older Saxi said, the only thing you learn from history is that no one learns from history. <laughs> when are you going to write a rollicking story on the East India Company? East India Company. I've done a kind of East India Company trilogy. There's three of them now. There's White Moguls, Last Mogul, and this one. Um, so, but I, uh, it's an overall one. Um, I, think in, I think you really probably need to be an economic historian to do that well. John Kay's written a very good one called The Honourable Company, an overall view. Um, but um, it is an extraordinary institution. Mm -hmm. Thank you. He survived. He was a hostage. Uh, and quite a lot of the British officer class survive. There are about 250 hostages taken, and they are basically exchanged for Dost Mohammed and his harem. Um, and he survives. And he then gets posted in Peshawar for the next 20 years because he speaks Dari and Pashtun by this stage. And when Dost Mohammed comes back, he very ruthlessly purges as the opposition, which includes his son, Akbar Khan, who's poisoned, probably on his orders, and almost all the people who hold the hostages. And each successive um, noble who is, uh, is fallen out of favor ends up in Peshawar, which has always been the eternal refuge of, of Afghan refugees, uh, and takes shelter with, uh, with Mackenzie. Yes, thank you. Yeah. On that note, I might ask those of you who still have questions to save it for the signing queue and the rest of you to join me in rapturous applause for the wonderful William Dalrymple. <laughs>